To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wal Adiyati Dabha Fal Muriyati Qadha Fal Mughirati Subha Fa Atharna Bihi Naqua Fa Wasatuna Bihi Jam'a إن الإنسان لربه لكنود وإنه على ذلك لشهيد وإنه لحب الخير لشديد أفلا يعلم إذا بعثر ما في القبور وحصل ما في الصدور إن ربهم بهم يومئذ لخبير الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today, inshallah ta'ala, we are engaged in a study of Surah Al-Adiyat. This is the 100th surah of the Qur'an. I hope to finish the dars on this surah, inshallah ta'ala, in a single session. Last week, we were covering the contents of the surah before this, surah number 99, surah Al-Zilzal. And as you recall, Allah Azza wa Jal dedicates that surah to one catastrophic event, when the earth is going to shake and it's going to reveal its contents. This surah, as we, will, as we explore this surah, we will discover that this surah actually expl- uh, uh, justifies the events of the previous surah. In other words, the earth is going to reveal its contents. But what is it that led to this? What was, what was happening before this that led to that eventual consequence? That's what we're going to study in this surah. So it's almost taking a step back in the next surah and serving as providing as justification and evidence for the coming surah to come. Now, or for the coming events uh, that, that are proceeding. Now, what, what we're going to learn in this surah, inshallah ta'ala, is the attitude of the human being, the greed of the human being, the carelessness and the heedlessness of the human being, and the things he does on this earth without fear of any consequence. The human being does things on this earth without caring what is going to be the result of this. I'm not going to get caught, so I don't care. In the previous surah, we learned he's going to be crying when the earth starts spilling its beans. يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا What's he gonna say? وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانِ مَا لَهَا What's wrong with it? He's gonna be shocked that the earth has all this record of everything he did. But this surah is about what, he, what in fact he was doing, what he was up to. This is another one of the surahs in which Allah Azza wa Jal begins with, by taking an oath. We've talked about oaths and the aqsam, the oaths in the Qur'an several times. But a few very cursory and fundamental points are important to mention. One of the challenges I have today, that's uh, something I have to overcome inshallah ta'ala, is a cross between a thorough academic sort of study of the surah versus an appreciation of the flow and the rhetoric of the surah. When you start quoting what this one said and what this one said and what this one said, you can get lost in those quotes and stop keeping track of what Allah is saying and the flow of the argument. You know, we have to interject in between everything Allah says, we have to interject and then study scholar, uh, at somewhat of a scholarly level the meaning of every word and the grammatical nuances and things like that. The benefit of that is of course we get depth in terms of what we're learning. But the disadvantage is you lose track of where, you're, where it's going. You, you, this, you, you fail to see the bigger picture, right? And the flow of the argument. That's the disadvantage. So we have to kind of try to find a balance between both of those things. I want to start by saying that this surah is one of my favorite, uh, in, favorites in the Qur'an when it comes to exploring the incredible logic of the Qur'an and the way in which the, the, the beautiful, creative way in which Allah sets up an argument. You know, the, the, the message of the Qur'an is very straightforward, very simple. But the power of the Qur'an is not, in, not just in what it says, but in how it says it. 
And this is a, a stellar example of how, how Allah presents an argument. How He sets up the mind of the listener in, in you know, conveying a message to them in a powerful way. And we know this of course, powerful speech isn't just about the right kind of words or the right, you know, the right message, it's also about the right style, the way you say something. You know, a friend of yours can give you advice and you won't take it seriously. But somebody else gives you the same advice with much more forceful language or language that really hits your heart, even though in the end the advice is the same, you take it a lot more seriously because it was presented to you in a way that impacted you more. So that's the kind of thing we're going to try to explore inshallah ta'ala today. As a brief reminder again about the oaths, essentially in the Qur'an, there are two components when Allah takes an oath. The first component is called al bihi, which in simple terms we'll call the object of the oath. And the other component is the muqsam alayhi, which is the subject of the oath. So in English, it's the object of the oath and the subject of the oath. Now what are these things? If I say to you in English, I swear by the sun, it's going to be a hot day if I say that to you, right? I, even though we're not supposed to say that because we only swear by Allah. But I'm only doing this for the purpose of example. If I say, I swear by the sun, it's going to be a hot day. Then the sun is the object of the oath. The sun is the object. It's going to be a hot day is the subject. Another example, if I say, I swear by my family, I will take revenge. Now I said, I swear by my family, I will take revenge. What's the object? My family. And what's the subject? I will take revenge. You understand the connection between the two? Now, in the Qur'an also you have the object of the oath and you have the subject of the oath. Different mufassirun have commented in various ways about the, you know, the, the proper interpretation and proper study of the oaths in the Qur'an, the objects and the subjects. The, ba- the most basic principle you have to keep in mind inshaAllah ta'ala is the object of the oath is always preparing you for the subject of the oath in the Qur'an. Whenever you study the object, it always has something to do with the subject. Now sometimes mufassirun did not keep in line with this principle. This, this is the most simplest principle of muqsam bihi and muqsam alayhi. They're connected together. But some mufassirun had the principle that no, the object is separate and the subject is separate. The two have nothing to do with each other, not necessarily. Okay? Now when you go by that line of argument, then you know there's, a, there's room for attack. And what's the room for attack? Then you could say, well why don't you take these oaths in this surah, these objects, and put them in that surah, and why don't you take those oaths from that surah and put them here, because they're not connected with anything else, right? They're just independent in and of themselves, so what's the benefit of them? Why these oaths over here, and why those oaths over here? Why watini wa zaytun wa turi sinin wa had al balad al amin? Why those objects in that surah? Why wal asr? That's an object of the oath. What's the subject? Inna al insana lafi khusr. That's the subject, right? So the, the stronger argument really is that the object, the muqsam bihi, is always rhetorically connected to the subject. Now, the purpose in ancient Arabic for taking an oath, you know, nowadays we also say, I swear. We say that all the time. Now when I say I swear, one of the things is, one of the implications is I'm very serious. I'm not kidding around, I'm very very serious. That's when I say I swear, right? Which is true in, the, in ancient Arabic also. But another thing, another function of taking an oath, that is not the case anymore, is the oath was used to get your attention. It wasn't just used to set up an argument, it was also used first to get your attention. Now why does a speaker feel the need to get your attention? Obviously because whatever he's saying, you don't think you're interested. You're not interested, so he has to do something to get your attention first. If he says something important and you're not paying attention, then the point is lost. Yes, he said what he had to say, but the point wasn't just to say it, the point was to convey that message to you, so it reaches inside you. And it won't reach inside you until you're paying attention. You understand? So the subject, which is the actual point of this discussion, is not going to make, have any benefit until the audience is paying attention. So Allah Azza wa uses the oaths to grab the attention of the kuffar in this surah. The kuffar are not paying attention. They're not paying attention to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't want to hear it. So Allah Azza wa says something that immediately captures their attention. Now when you want to get somebody's attention, you have to talk about something that they want to hear. They don't want to hear what you have to say, they want to hear what, you know, what they like what they're interested in. So you keep this in the back of your mind as we begin the study of this surah. The first five ayat of this surah are oaths, aqsam. 
And so what we're going to, first thing we're going to learn as we go through the tafsir of these ayat is, these five ayat are dedicated to get the attention of the Arab. The entire purpose of them is to grab his attention. Now, you know many things about Arabs before Islam. One of the things you know is they lived in the desert. Another thing you may already know is they're pretty, pretty rough around the edges. They broke out into fights pretty easily. You so much as look at, look at one guy from the different tribe the wrong way, and they're in a fight with each other for generations. Right? And they're, they're after each other's blood because some guy slapped some guy's sheep or something, something trivial like that, but it, they'll break out into feuds that'll, that are never ending. Now, the Arabs were also, they also had this thing we call nowadays an entertainment industry. Okay? Now our entertainment industry could be like videos and music and movies and things like that. But they don't have any of this stuff. They have none of this stuff. What do they have? How do they entertain themselves? Well, they entertain themselves with this thing we call poetry. Which is not so much different from our times. Even today, you know, some artist gets up there in front of a thousand people and he's spitting out rhymes and everybody's bopping their head. And a few thousand years ago, this Arab guy, there's a bonfire, there's a couple of Bedouins sitting there, he's spitting his rhymes in Arabic and everybody's bopping their head. It's pretty much the same thing. It's the ancient version of a con- concert. And in music and in entertainment, you talk about subjects that people want to hear about. Nowadays, a songwriter might talk about cars or women or shamelessness or whatever people are into. They'll pick subjects that people want to hear about, right? They're not going to talk about justice and peace and family and values. Nobody cares. They're not going to talk about what your purpose in life is and you're going to be raised after you. They don't care. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear it. People have a subject they're interested in. One of the things the Arabs were really interested in was battle. Like we are, you know, nowadays we are entertained by battle. We call them action movies, right? It's the same idea, right? They loved stories of battle, scenes of battle, poetry about battle, right? That's one thing they were obsessed with. Another thing we're obsessed with nowadays are cars, right? And their version of cars was what? Especially fast car. Horses. So we have horsepower and they had horses, but it's the same thing. In the end it's horsepower, right? So they had that. They were very obsessed with that. These were the few things that, they, that really caught their attention. This surah begins with a series of oaths that are dedicated to two things, battle horses and the battlefield. We're gonna learn in these five ayat, Allah is grabbing their attention with vivid language, all of which is dedicated to the battle horse and the scene of battle. So inshallah ta'ala, with that background, we begin the study of the first ayah. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَ Allah is taking an oath. And He says, I swear by al-adiyat. The word adiyah in Arabic, it comes from the word adu, which means to have animosity. But adi, the, the masculine form, is used for someone who's running in battle against the enemy. You know, there's in, in battle, there's one thing you're preparing for the enemy, or your enemies. But when you're actually running towards your enemy, and you know when somebody's running towards the enemy, they don't look left or right, they don't care about anything else. All they care about is, I'm gonna kill that guy over there. They're charging towards him. Now that's the form of the word that's been used, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ I swear by battle horses that are marching forward with animosity. That's, the, that's what Allah swears by. Now do you think this is something that would get the Arabs' attention? Oh my goodness. For him, this is like the trailer of an action movie. He, I mean, you know what they do in trailers, right? They show you a little bit of the movie, and they build your, uh, they build your interest, and right when they get to the most interesting part of the trailer, what do they do? They cut a short, say, pay us 10 bucks next summer. Right? That's what they do. That's, that's a strategy in trailers. Now this scene is being built, which in itself is it's extremely exciting, this scene that Allah Azza wa builds with, his words, with these words. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ The feminine plural. This at at the end that you hear, is what's, what's called جمع مؤنث سالم. The feminine plural. So Allah is not swearing by horses that are males. males he's actually swearing by mares. Female horses. Why? Because they used to be faster in battle. The Arabs used to prefer the female horse over the male horse. So already this is not just any car, this is the exotic car. Right? This is the faster one. And it's headed right into battle. This is an action scene from the very beginning. Then Allah adds the ha'al dabha. This is Baydawi rahimahullah. He says, I'lam anna dabh aswat an fasil khayl idha adat. You should know the word dabha at the end is describing, you should know it's describing an fasil khayl, the breath, the panting of the horse when it's, in, in, when it's in, uh, engaged in aggressive motion. You know when a horse is galloping really fast, you hear that like, that, that sound you hear? The word for that in Arabic is dabh. 
dhabh. By using that word, we're learning that this horse is going as fast as it can. It's going as fast as it can. And it's marching forward towards what? An enemy. And how do we know there's an enemy ahead? Because of what word? Wal adiyat. And Allah is swearing by the scene. So the Arab who's got a very wild imagination, you know what he's imagining? He's sitting on top of this horse, and it's marching full speed, and he can even hear what? The panting, the dhabh that's taking place of the horse. So he's completely engulfed and, and encapsulated by this image. Then he says, this is Al-Baydawi again, rahimahullah, he says, فَإِنَّهَا تَدُلُّ بِالْإِلْتِزَامِ عَلَى الضَّابِحَاتِ By using the word, you know, عَادِيَاتِ uh, as an ism fa'il. What Allah is saying is, these horses are known or were designed to be used in battle. You know, there's a really fast car and it's sitting, sitting in a parking lot. That's not what it was designed for. It was designed to be floored. Right? It was designed to be working on full throttle. That's when you see what it was made to do. By using the word al-adiyat in the active participle, the ism fa'il form, what Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, it's finally getting to do what it was made to do. It's using its full potential. Wal-adiyat yadabha. Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah comments. Wal-adiyat jamu'u adiyah wa hiya al-jariyah bi sur'ah. Adiyat is the plural of adiyah and it's the plural, uh, and, and it means that which is moving with great speed, min al-adu, because of animosity. Wa huwa al-mashi bi sur'ah and its movement with great speed. فَأَبْدَلَتِ الْوَاوْ بِالْكَسْرِ مَا قَبْلَهَا This is a sort of a lesson in morphology. For those of you who don't know sarf, this won't make any sense. But عَادِيَاتِ that ya at the end, that ya at the end, is actually replacing with a wow. It's, it's, the original letters are عَيْن, dal and wow. But in, sometimes when words are formulated in Arabic, one vowel is replaced with another. So that's really what he's talking about. I won't go more into it because I see the look of confusion on your face already. So, so dabhan مَصْدَرْ مُؤَكَّدْ لِإِسْمِ الْفَاعِلِ This dabhan, uh, what uh, Al-Baydabi rahmahullah, actually Ash-Shawkani is saying rahmahullah, is being used at the end to emphasize that it's not taking a single break. That this panting is going on continuously and it's not taking a single break. Now this entire image that I'm painting you, painting for you so far is how many ayat thus far? Just one. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَةِ This is just the first two words. And already it's, it's very very powerful in its, in its uh, depiction. But the thing I want to share with you inshallah ta'ala without getting into a more grammatical discourse which in the end isn't really all that relevant because the meaning comes out to be essentially the same. وَنَقَلَ أَهْلُ اللُّغَةِ أَنَّ أَصْلَ الضَّبْحِ لِلثَّعْلَبِ This is very important. The linguists have commented and they have archived that the word ضَبْحِ in Arabic isn't originally used for horses. It's secondarily used for horses. It is originally used for wolves. It's originally not used for horses, but for wolves. So now what we're learning here is, Allah is comparing battle horses to what? A pack of wolves. And a pack of wolves does not attack an enemy that it thinks is stronger than itself. It, it attacks an enemy that it thinks is weaker, it can destroy them. They can d devour the enemy. They're defenseless, right? So it shows the confidence of those who are engaged in this battle, they're gonna go after their enemy like the wolves go after their prey. That's the image that's being captured just by the word, use of the word dabh in the ayah. There has been a difference of opinion among the mufassirun about the meaning of the word uh, or the interpretation of adiyat. Some have actually called it the camels that are heading in the, in the season of hajj. That that, that's what these camels, they're panting really hard and that's what Allah is swearing by. There are two evidences against that. First of all, the rest of the language doesn't support it. That's the first evidence against it. The second evidence against it is that the entire surah has nothing to do with hajj, nor is it a madani surah where the injunctions of hajj came down. It's a makki surah, even an early makki surah at that. So it doesn't connect with the rhetoric of the rest of the ayah. You will find these opinions in some tafasir. Why? Because the methodology of not connecting the object with the subject isn't there by some. Some people didn't accept that methodology. So when, they, when, you, don't, when you disconnect the two, then you get 30 different opinions on what that is. It could be anything then. Anything that's moving fast. Anything that's panting. But if you connect it with the rest of the surah, now the meaning gets caged and it has a proper direction. And then, you know, the mufassirun comment on it with precision. A couple of other comments about the word adiyat. Adi, a group is, that is adamant or on standby for pillaging and warfare. This is what we learn from Mufradat al-Qur'an. The word adi is a group that is kind of waiting to attack. And it wants to pillage and destroy its enemy. Ad al-Faras. The horse galloped aggressively, as the Arabic expression goes. Ta'ad al-Qawmu. 
Ta'ada, same root, it's used from the you know, tafa'ul form. It means when a, a nation is racing against one another aggressively. So all of these words, all the implications are moving fast and being aggressive against an enemy. That's the bottom line in the words, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَ Now we come to the next ayah, فَالْمُورِيَاتِ قَبْحَ The first thing to note here is the letter fa. Instead of wa, the first ayah was, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ The second one is, فَالْمُورِيَاتِ fa. This is a very very important subtle concept in especially understanding the oaths of the Qur'an. There are certain letters that are called huruf al-atf. Okay? They are, or adawat al-atf even. They are uh, letters that connect a sentence to another. If this was a wa, if this was a wow, then it would mean the first ayah is one scene and this ayah is a different scene. They're two different scenes. But if the first one is a wa and the second one is fa, which is what we find here, this is a continuation of the previous scene. This is not a new image, now we're getting more details about the same scene. You understand? Now what happens sometimes is in the Qur'an you have wal mursalati urfa. It began with what? Wa. Fal asifati asfa. Fa. So it's a new thing or a continuation? It's a continuation. But the next ayah, wal nashirati nashra. Wa. Now it's a new scene, you understand? So two were connected, then the rest is connected. That's what's happening here. Wa, and now look, I'll, I'll read forward so I don't have to bring this up again. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَ فَالْمُورِيَاتِ قَبْحَ فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ صُبْحَ فَأَثَرْنَ بِهِ نَقْعَ فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعَ Do you see fa in all of them? That means all of that is what? One scene. All of that is one scene. They're not separate scenes, they are one continuous scene. And the evidence of that is fa. Had they been separate scenes, what would we have found? Wa. Which is what we found in Surah At-Teen. Different oaths. Wa tini, wa zaytuni, wa turisini, wa hadha al-balad al-ameen. They were separate things. So they were separated by a wow. But here, they're one thing, they're, they're, so they're connected with a fa. You, you with me so far? So now we come to fal muriyati qabha. The word muriyat is also what's called in Arabic an ism fa'il. It's also plural and feminine, which means it's describing the same horses, that same band of horses that was marching forward and panting in the previous ayah. The other thing we learn here about the word, these, these muriyat is that as they are running, the word ira from which muriyat comes is a description, it's an adjective for these horses. Ira is to cause sparks to fly when you strike something. You know, there are different kinds of starting fire. You know, in Arabic there's awqada, to start a fire also. There are like 10 words in Arabic in the Qur'an to start a fire. This is one of those words. Ira is one of 10 words to start a fire. So what does this word specifically mean? What kind of fire? You know when two things rub against each other and a fire starts? Like you rub rocks against each other, or rub wood against each other, dry things against each other, that sort of thing. By rubbing or by, by, by strike, when sparks or flames are produced, that is called ira. So Allah is saying these horses are, are causing fires. These horses are creators of fire as they are galloping. What does that mean? You know the horse is running really fast, and it's got a horseshoe on, which is metal and it strikes on the rock as it's running. And what happens every time the rock strikes? Sparks are flying. So they're, they're basically creating a fire as they run. It's like an it's added intensity to the scene. Right? They're, blaze, they're literally blazing a trail behind them. Now, فَالْمُورِيَاتِ Then is the word qadha. Qadha in Arabic is a violent strike that is very loud. So it already has the implication of the spark flying. For example, by the way, in, in, in regards to the word uh, we also find it in the Qur'an, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ النَّارَ الَّتِي تُورُونَ Don't you see the fire that you cause, that you create by striking things together? The word qadha implies their very loud gallops. Every strike is very very loud and violent. So now this rider who is captured in the image of this surah, the horse was already running fast, it was already panting, and now as he's riding it, he looks down, what does he see? He sees these sparks flying, it's, it's, the scene got even more intense. Right? Just think of it as, an, you know, it's, it's hard for us to develop the imagination of the ancient Arab, but just imagine for your benefit, just imagine this is an action movie, and just try to picture this scene. Just try to picture this scene of these horses, just a small, adiyat by the way, jam'u qillah. So it's a small bunch of horses, less than 10. So it's a small group, small group of bandits if you will, very few, and they're marching forward and these sparks are flying. Then he says, فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subha. Then the next scene, مُغِيرَات يُغِيرُ أَهْلَهَا عَلَى الْعَدُو ضَبْحَا أَيْ فِي وَقْتِهِ Let's take the meaning one at a time. We'll go to Al-Baydawi rahimahullah. They take their riders right on top of the enemy. 
Ighara in Arabic means to ambush. That's from the word Mughirat. It means to ambush. So we're learning these horses now. First they were marching and galloping forward, but in the next ayah, they've already reached the enemy and it's time to ambush the enemy. So they're, they're at the point of contact. Ighara, to ambush or to attack the enemy or to be right on top of him. And by using that for the horses, what we're learning is, the horses delivered the rider who's the actual ahl of the horse, the, the actual rider, the owner of the horse, they took him right on top of the enemy. So the enemy was, is like on the ground, and this guy's with his spear above him, literally hovering over him. And that's the, the, the image captured by the word al-mughirat. أي التي تغير على العدو وقت الصباح this is the other meaning of the word subha at the end. This is what's called maf'ul fihi and darf uh, uh, zaman. They ambush the enemy in the morning time. Subhan. Now, what is this? What's the benefit of Allah saying they ambush the enemy in the morning time? If you know anything about ambushing and attacking, and you know these Arabs were basically bandits. Who the, the people being described here are are bandits. You know some mufassirun say this is talking about the the sahaba in battle. This is wrong on a couple of accounts, and the, the counter-argument by Mufassirun is stronger. Why? First, it's a Makki surah, so there's no battle. That's the first thing. The second issue is the, 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 the Sahaba, if they were, this was describing the, the Sahaba in battle, then the, the subject of the oath would have to do with the believers. But the subject of the oath has to do with disbelievers. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ it doesn't have to do with believers, it has to do with disbelievers. So it, it's a discontinuous kind of argument to think that this is from the Sahaba. But I should tell you what mentality that comes from, why that opinion even exists. It exists because among the Mufassirun, there was a widely held opinion that became popular. It's not really necessarily based on any direct evidence, but it's an opinion that became popular. What's that evidence? If Allah swears by something, it must be sacred. If Allah swears by something, it must be something holy, or something righteous, or something good, or something pure, or something noble or honorable. But the, the counter-argument is that may or may not be the case. The primary thing is Allah is making a point by the object, the point will be made in the subject. That's the actual fundamental principle. This overshadows the other principle of saying the object may or may not be sacred, if you follow. Okay? Now, فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subha. They ambush the enemy at what time? Subh. And you know, this, uh, uh, I want to tell you a couple more things about the word al-ighara. يُقَالُ أَغَارَ يُقِيرُ إِغَارَةً إِذَا بَاغَتْ عَدُوَّهُ بِقَتْلٍ The word ighara is used when you go against the enemy, when this band goes against the enemy with the intent to kill. أَوْ أَسَرْ أَوْ نَهَبْ Or to attack them secretly, or to rob them and pillage them. So these are all crimes. The word is used for criminal behavior, which is another reason why we wouldn't use it for the Sahaba. So this, you know, more linguistic evidence is why the tafsir is pointing in one direction. Then of course, because the ism fa'il, the active participle is used, وَأَسْنَدَ الْإِغَارَةَ إِلَيْهَا The use of the noun, Allah attributed ighara as a noun to them. When a noun is used in Arabic, it means whatever you're talking about is known for that quality. So what we're saying then is the horses are known for running really fast. They are known that whenever they run, sparks fly. And they are known, these horses are known for, for being bandits and attacking the enemy. And they are also famous for doing that at what time? In the morning, subhan. But if you know anything about attacking and robbing and pillaging, then you know the best time to do that is not the morning. The best time to do that is at night. When the enemy doesn't know where you came from, where you left. You can use the cloak of darkness to your advantage. But these guys over here that are being talked about, they don't care. They're attacking at what time? In the morning, which is particularly, it, it adds a couple of interesting nuances to this discussion. How so? The first thing to note is in the morning there's a lot of moisture. Things are wet. Even the rocks and the ground, there's a lot of drops of, of water on it. But even though it's wet, what is flying anyway? Sparks are flying anyway. It becomes even more of a contradiction in the scene. That how fast are these horses running, that even the water evaporates immediately and turns into sparks of flame. SubhanAllah. فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subha. Then here what I want to share with you is the two words in Arabic basically that are used for attacking. This is one of those words, aghara to attack and ambush. Another word that's used in the Quran is satwa. Seen, ta and wow. Satwa. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Yakaduna yastuna billadina yatluna alayhim ayatina. But more on that when we get to that ayah one day. Ighara in Arabic from a linguistic origin means to go deep into something. 
Like if somebody goes deep into the countryside, they leave and they go deep into the boonies. Like if we go from here to like, I don't know, Plano, right? If we go way out there, or we go like, you know, to, to Mansfield or something. I have to knock on Mansfield. I have a friend in Mansfield. Anyway, so you go out all the way out there or something. The word you will use in Arabic for that is, uh, you know, Agar al-Faras or Agar al-Rajul, which means the man went way deep. And by using that word for ambush, what we're learning is, they don't just attack, they go deep into the lines of the enemy. They get into the heart of the town and attack them. Okay? So, فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subha. The other thing to note about morning, is if you're attacking in the morning, it means you want the enemy to know you're coming. If you're attacking at night, you want the element of surprise. But if you're attacking in the morning, you want the enemy to know, and it's like you don't even care. Why don't you care? Because you're like wolves. You're not afraid of your prey. The wolf is running after a rabbit, it's not gonna, you know, it doesn't care. It's gonna eat it anyway, right? It's not afraid of a battle. There's not gonna be a contest. So this is the kind of confidence these, these riders and these raiders really have in the, in the people they're about to attack. Now we get into the heart of the matter where the action begins. This was just preparation for the action. Now the action begins. And you know in action, a verb is used. So now we, there's, from a linguistics point of view, there's a transition from verb, from nouns. You know, uh, al-adiyat is a noun. Al-muriyat is a noun. Al-muhirat is a noun. But now fa'atharna, that's a verb. So there's a transition from noun to verb, which means the action is intensifying. That's what that implies, okay? فَأَثَرْنَا Then they cause, these horses they cause, that's the feminine plural, أَثَرْنَا Noon and Niswa, it's used for the horses, because عَادِيَات is plural. So they cause, they cause something to rise. أَثَرَ in Arabic is to cause something to rise. What is it that they cause to rise? نَقْعَ نَقْعَ in Arabic is one of three words in the Qur'an used for dust. There's غَبَرَة Ghabara, there's haba, like haba and manthura, and then there's this word naqa. Naqa is used in Arabic when something is moving really fast, like a car or a caravan or even a horse. You know, when something moves really fast in the dust, what rises behind it? A cloud of dust, it leaves a trail of dust. So even if it's gone, you could see some, some horse went by here because I still see the cloud of dust, right? That cloud of dust is called naqa. It's not just any dust, it's specifically the dust that rises up in the air when something moves by the, in really fast motion. So, these horses, they cause this clouds, a cloud of dust to rise. But before we get, go further into the next ayah, we have to discuss the word bihi. فَأَثَرْنَا bihi naqa. We talked a little bit about فَأَثَرْنَا, we talked about naqa. They cause, they cause to rise, that's أَثَرْنَا. Naqa is the cloud of dust that they're causing to rise. But the word we're missing in the middle is bihi. So what is that bihi? The pronoun he, it referring to. It could be referring to makan. For example, وَقِيلَ الْمَعْنَ فَأَثَرْنَا بِمَكَانِ عَدُوِّهِنَّ نَقْعَ In other words, when they attack, when the action, when the fighting begins, there's so much action on the ground that dust is rising and you can't even see your enemy. So once the battle begins, it's completely covered and engulfed in dust. You can barely see in front of you in the chaos of battle. That's one implication of bihi. The second is, bihi could be referring to the morning. That even though it's morning and the sand is damp, when sand is damp and, and moist, it doesn't rise. But even though it's the morning, this is some intense battle that this, despite that, the dust is rising anyway. Or this bihi could be the qadh, meaning because of the striking of the horses, they're causing the, these clouds of dust to rise. Abu Ubaidah rahimahullah had an opinion about the word naqar, which is a minor opinion, but it should be addressed inshaAllah ta'ala. An naq'u raf'u sawt. Naqar in Arabic also means to elevate your voice, to raise your voice. The first meaning is a cloud of dust. But the second meaning also is to raise your voice. And the two are rhetorically connected in Arabic. Why? Because when you get lost in a cloud of dust, how do you get found? By raising your voice. You can't be seen anymore, so you can only be heard. By using that word rhetorically, another dimension added to this scene is, these horses are in battle, dust everywhere, they're marching as fast as they can, you know, sparks are flying, and now you hear screaming. Right? It's become even you know, you know, a, a, an intense scene because of the use of the word naqa in addition to what it already was. Now we get to the final ayah of the oath. فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعًا Then they penetrate. Wasat. Wasat in Arabic is to, the, to penetrate right to the middle of something. فَوَسَطْنَ Then these horses penetrate to the very middle. You know how in Surah Al-Baqarah Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَ Same word is used, the middle nation. Same word is being used here. Wasatna in the verbal form. This is the feminine plural verbal form. 
And because of that battle, and because of that cloud of dust, using that to their advantage, they penetrate all of them, وَسَطَنَا is the feminine plural, so the entire group penetrates all of them bihi, using adva- the advantage of the cloud of dust, jam'a all together. So what we're learning here is something really incredible. You know, when you attack the enemy, especially if you know the, the enemy knows you're coming, the enemy's waiting with his spears, he sees the cloud of dust rising, he knows you're on the way. Because that scene has already been said. Now look at it from the camera angle of the enemy, he knows you're coming. He sees the sun rising, he sees the sparks, and he sees the cloud of dust. He could see you from a distance coming. When that's the case, you don't go all out against the enemy. You ever seen sort of a battlefield, even a mock battlefield, even in video games they do this? You send the first wave, then you send the second wave. You don't shoot, you don't throw all your forces in at once. That's suicide. You're gonna get killed. Because you have no backup support left. Everybody went in. But first of all, we learned these are very few. Adiyat, the feminine plural, jam'u qilla, they're few. Second, we learned they all went in. They don't even care. They all went into the heart of the enemy. فَأَثَرْنَ بِهِ Actually, فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ jam'a They penetrated into the very gathering of the enemy. What this, the word jam'a could be imply, applied to the horses, these guys that are attacking. Jam'a could also be used for the enemy. Meaning they went right into the heart of the entire gathering. Now you can imagine, though the enemy also has line one, line two, line three. You know how soldiers stand in lines? And these guys, it's almost like they formed a spear and they, they, they penetrated right through those lines, crushing their way in. And where are they now? In the middle. And when they're in the middle, where's the enemy? The, you know, before the enemy was in front of them, but now when they're in the middle, where's the enemy? All around them. The enemy's all around them. فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعًا Now, when I stop here, I mean, just, I, mean I wanted to give you some, some uh, background about the, the word ba a little bit, فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ B could be transit, transitivity, we said taking advantage of the dust. But also ba here could mean الحالية, which means immediately as the dust cloud rises, immediately, there's no hesitation. They go right into the heart of the battle. Okay. After we said all of this, the Arab who is listening, no mention of stories of the prophets, no halal or haram, no day of judgment, no Allah is one, no accept the messenger, no why do you kill the baby daughter, why do you do this, why do you do that, nothing. No religious instruction at all for five ayat. All these ayat are doing their what? He's getting his attention. And it's talking about stuff he really wants to hear. And by the time you get in this trailer to where these, these guys are in the middle of the enemy and they're all around him, the Arab's eyes are bulging out. He's like, what happened next? And the screen turns black. Allah doesn't say anymore. <laughs> he's got his attention now, right? That's when he's got his full attention. Now it's a climactic moment. You want to know what happened next. That's what you want to know really badly. Now at that point, Allah says what He wanted to say all along. Had He said what He... The agenda was not the object. Remember, the, uh, the agenda is never the object. The agenda is the subject. Now Allah will present the subject. Now understand the difference between presenting the subject now and presenting the subject before. If you present the subject before, what's the disadvantage? Nobody's paying attention. But if you present the subject now, they, they're, they're for, stop listening to everything else. If somebody's talking, they say, hey, listen to this man. I'm trying to listen here. <laughs> right? Their, their full attention is gone this way. Now what does Allah Azza wa Jal say to them? Before I tell you what He says, I want to tell you something more about what the Arab is thinking. The Arab loves the horse. Loves the horse. He loves the battle horse on top of that. On top of that, he loves the battle horse that's female because it's fast. On top of that, he loves the battle horse that is female and fast and is willing to risk its own life. For who? For the master. The Arabs used to make poetry about the horse all the time. فِي فَرَسٍ نَهْدٍ عَتِيقٍ جَعَلْتُهُ حِجَابًا بِالْبَيْتِ ثُمَّ أَخْدَمْتُهُ عَبْدًا The poet makes poetry and he says, I have a beautiful horse. It is so exotic that I have placed for him a barrier so nobody can look at him and I even hired a servant to take care of him. They love their horse. They make poetry about how obsessed they are with their horse. The way you talk about your car, you know I could put new rims on it man. Right? I'll put a dual exhaust or I put this system on it. <laughs> right? their, their system is what? I put a new saddle on this guy. <laughs> or whatever, right? They're obsessed with this horse. And these ayat are just talking about this horse. And this guy is appreciating, man, this horse is so loyal. When it's, when it's life and death, 
When the enemy's spear attacks, it doesn't hit me first. Who does it hit first? My horse. And if you know anything about animals, they have this crazy thing called animal instinct. Which means when they see danger, what do they do? They run away. But this horse is so loyal to me, it's willing to give up its own survival, its own animal instinct for loyalty to me. Right? It's a, he's, the Arab is appreciating the loyalty that his, his horse shows him. He's the master and the, 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 the horse is a slave. And he shows loyalty. Allah says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُونَ no doubt the human being is truly disloyal to his master. Allah says the human being is not loyal to his master at all, for sure. SubhanAllah. A second ago this guy was thinking, man, how loyal this, that's the slave, I'm the master and how loyal he is. And then Allah says, no, 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 actually you're a slave and you have a master and you're not very loyal at all. SubhanAllah. How the argument is constructed. How it's, how it's really a curveball that is thrown at this, this mushrik from where he couldn't have imagined. You know, it attacks him from where he couldn't have imagined. And it hits him really hard. And it doesn't hit him in here, it hits him in here. It hits him in his heart. Right? He can't even come, come up with like intellectual arguments now. No, no, no. Because you know, he feels it at this point. And when you feel something, you're left speechless. You're completely, utterly left speechless. And that's what Allah Azza wa does in this ayah. Let's talk a little bit about this word kanud. Most mufassirun they comment on this word and they say kanud a kafur. Kanud means ungrateful. Uh, mostly they say that it means ungrateful. Kafur lin ni'ma, uh, ungrateful to the favor. Allah has given the human being so much. Allah has even given the human being ability over animals and so much ability that they surrender themselves to Him. And Allah gave the human being this ability so He would obey Him on this earth. The human being's job was he's given all these facilities. I'll give you intellect, I'll give you power over animals, I'll give you, I'll give you knowledge, I'll give you civilization. So you do what? You obey me. Allah gives you all this, and what does the Arab use all this for? To rob. <laughs> right? He gives you all these gifts, and what are you using them? To rob the other enemy, and when the robbing is being talked about, you're all into it too. Oh, man, this is getting good. You know? They're, so Allah basically used his false, deviated idea of you know, what should be elevated, what should be appreciated. And by the way, we do this too. In the movie industry in, in, in the modern West, criminals are turned into heroes, right? They, they we're gonna rob a bank and we're gonna make a movie about it. Or we're gonna steal a few million dollars and we're gonna, these are the, you know, good actor, that's a great movie, man, the way they stole, right? Or the way they committed zina or whatever, right? The, all the haram is glorified. It's glorified, right? And we say, man, that was a great action movie. <laughs> Right? They got those poor, hard-working people pretty good. You know? This twisted sense of morality, Allah Azza wa Jalla uses it, entertains them with it, and then attacks them. When they were least expecting it, He attacks them, and, and, and cuts off their moral foundation. Al-Kanud, ay huwa, huwa al-qata' aybun. We find a shawkan in commenting, Kanud also means cutting apart, to, dis, to disassociate, to separate. Meaning the human being separates himself, from the mastery and the, the slavery to Allah. He disassociates himself. The horse doesn't disassociate himself from the rider. But the slave of Allah, this human being, he disassociates himself from his master. SubhanAllah. But then I want to share with you the difference. You know, Arabic is really, the, the beauty of the Arabic language is when you t look at words that are the same meaning, and you discover what makes them different. So if the ulama say that kanud is like kafur, exceedingly ungrateful, that's what they have in common. But what do they have that's different? What do they have that's different? Why is that even more important? Let me tell you. In the insana, the ayah begins. In the insana. Now listen. Listen to these other places. In Surah Ibrahim, he says, "In the insana, la zalumun kafar." In Surah Al-Hajj, "In the insana, la kafur." In Surah Al-Shura, "Fa in the insana kafur." In Surah Al-Zukhruf, "In the insana, la kafur mubin." Then, so in all of these ayat, what did you hear? Kanud or kafur? Kafur, kafar, kafur, kafur, kafur. And this is one place in Quran where instead of saying kafur, what does he say? Kanud. So there's a difference. If it was the same thing, that word has been used elsewhere too. So what makes this word special? What's different about kafur than kanud? For once again, what do these two words have in common? To be ungrateful. That's what they have in common. But let's go further. This is a special type of ingrate, kanud. First of all, this is siratul mubalagha. So it's extremely ungrateful. It's not just ungrateful. It's extremely ungrateful. How do we know that? Because of the wow. In Kanud, this is Sigatul Mubalagha. Okay? 
one who remembers and makes only mention of the problems and complaints and never makes mention of favors. That's the guy, kind of person that's called kanud. So when you ask a person how's life and what do they what do they remember? All their problems and what don't they accept? All the good things that are happening to them. Like for example, you ask how's marriage? Ah man, she's got problems. She doesn't listen. She does this. She does that. You got all these list of problems, and you ask. Can you give me a small list of things you should be grateful for in your marriage? Something Allah has given you in your marriage that you should be grateful for? I can't think of anything, I don't know. Kanood. That's the attitude of kanood. There's so much Allah has given us, and you can remember the complaints, but you can't remember the favors. Right? You open up the fridge, and you see like eight different kinds of juice, and four different kinds of soda. Oh man, no Pepsi! Right? You know what that is? That's kanood. Instead of showing gratitude for everything you do have, what are you whining about? The one thing you don't have. And we even teach this to our kids, that's the crazy thing. We teach them since they're little to become kanood, it's scary. How? We take them to the toy store, right? We take, you, one of the biggest mistakes you'll make in your life is take your child to a toy store. No child, you, go observe this, okay? No child ever walks out of a toy store happy, ever. You buy them something for $10, $20, $100, $200, whatever you spend on them. As they are leaving, where are their eyes? On the two million dollars of merchandise left behind. You understand? We're not, te- we're, instead of teaching them to be grateful, we're teaching them, oh, can we get that next time? Can we get that too? We're, always, we're training them to want more, subhanAllah. We have to learn to avoid these things, they're subtle things but they embed in the psyche of a person. Right? And then when they get older, it's not toys. It's what they want out of a marriage. It's what they want out of their family. It's what they want out of their community. They're just always ungrateful. They're never happy. They're miserable people. In dunya and in akhirah. <laughs> this makes you miserable here. If you're grateful, you're happy in this world at least. You know, if you have a one-bedroom apartment and you're grateful to Allah, you'll be happy. But if you are ungrateful, you can have a 12-bedroom and you're still unhappy. Because there's a 13-bedroom with, with somebody else. You're not happy. You saw somebody else who has more. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Inna al-insana li Rabbihi lakanud." Especially when it comes to his master, he is extremely ungrateful. Extremely dis. The, the word kanud also includes disloyal. Has no loyalty. Allah gave him this, this, this. You know, the, the master says to the horse, "I gave you food. I gave you a stable. I give you shelter. I feed you. I take care of you. You better ride for me." Right. The, the, the master demands when he gives to the property. We have that demand. And whenever we own something, we expect things from it. Okay, we don't own horses anymore, we own computers. Right? You expect things from your computer, it stops work and you throw it away. Useless piece of junk. Right? In the olden days, somebody owns a cow, I'm gonna milk this cow, it stops giving milk, okay, you know what, I'm gonna slaughter you. At least I'll get beef out of you. Right? The idea is, if it's mine, it better do what I want it to do, it better show me loyalty. Allah says, I own you. I am the master, you're the slave. I'm al Malik, was Sayyid, wal Murabbi, wal Mun'im, wal Qayyim. These are the meanings of Rabb, the one who owns, the one who has complete authority. You know, th- th- these meanings I say all the time. But I, I, you can't help but repeat this, because it's such a deep concept. You know, when we own something, in this, in this world, not right now, you own something, but you don't have full rights. You own it, you still don't have full rights. You own your car, but you don't have full rights over your car. You can't do whatever you want. You have to put the seat belt on, you have to do emissions inspection, you have to do this, that, the other. You own your house, you can't do whatever you want. You have restrictions, even on the things you own, you don't have authority. But Allah, when He says He's Rabb, He owns us and He has authority. This is unlike any other ownership. And it's despite that authority, He gives, He gives, He gives, and He doesn't punish, subhanAllah. And then what do we do in return? And He gives, we become even more disloyal, even more ungrateful. This is the human being. Inna al-insan li rabbihi lakanud. Now these ayat of inna al-insan, they can, this is the second last, last place in the Quran where inna al-insan occurs. The final place in the Quran is Surah Al-Asr. And when we come to that ayah of inna al-insan la fi khusr, when we come to that ayah, we'll look at all these ayat again and discover the beautiful treasure. Why is that the last one that says inna al-insan? And why is that different? All the other places where Allah made declarations about the human being, some of which I shared with you today, right? But at the end of it, in the insan la fi khusr. That's the climax of it all, subhanAllah. So this is in the insan li rabbihi la kanud. Let me see if I want to share anything with you. Uh, actually, I got everything here. Wa inna huwa ala dhalika la shahid. 
And there is no doubt that he, meaning the human being, especially when it comes to that, is truly a witness. I'm, I'm rough translation. As, no doubt, he, the human being, especially when it comes to that, ذلك, that. You know what that is? That is the fact that he is ungrateful and disloyal. That's what that is referring to. Kunuduhu. Okay. La shahid. He's truly a witness. وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكْ وَإِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ عَلَى كُنُودِهِ لَشَهِيدٍ يَشْهَدُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ لِظُهُورِ أَثْرِهِ عَلَيْهِ Allah Azza wa Jalla, the Tafsir al-Baybabi comments that Allah is saying as follows, that human, the human being is truly a witness against his own ingratitude and disloyalty, and he bears witness against himself as it manifests, its effects manifest on him in his character, in his behavior. And the biggest example for the Arab is how he's robbing and pillaging. How he's, doing, how he's using what he owns to disobey Allah. Allah gave him those things so he can obey Allah. He uses those very things to disobey Allah. SubhanAllah. So, why not shahid? In Arabic, witness is shahid. Wa shahidun wa mashhud. Right? Shahid. But here we don't find the, we don't find the words, wa innahu ala dhalika la shahid. We find, wa innahu ala dhalika la shaheed. What's the difference between shahid and shaheed? Shahid is just fa'il, it's something that's happening at one time. Shaheed is sifa mushabbaha And this is what's, what we say something happening all the time So the human being is a witness to his disloyalty when? All the time It's not just one occasion It's not just one scene that was just described For, for this scene he was shahid But now that he's come to this realization He himself is a witness against himself all the time All the time The biggest testimony against you is your own self Allah captures this in another place in the Qur'an. He says, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَابِيرًا No, the human being is in full view against his own self, even if he makes excuses. The biggest witness against you is not anybody else on the Day of Judgment. You know when a, a, a witness is brought to the court? I saw him rob, I saw him steal. Guess who's brought to court on the Day of Judgment? You yourself. And who's gonna testify against you? Your own hands, your own limb, your own tongue, your own feet. Right? And you're gonna, you're gonna start complaining, لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا Why are you testifying against us? And Allah says, no, 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 you're a witness against your own self. You're enough as a witness. And on top of this, you know when you feel inside that I am disloyal, why am I like that? Why am I so messed up? In your heart you have already borne witness that you are not loyal. You don't have to, be, you don't have to even say it with your tongue. And this is a very important concept in Qur'anic logic. The Qur'an does not prove its point to others only by means of philosophical arguments. The Qur'an proves its point to people by making them feel deep inside them what the truth is. And that's what this surah is about. It's not about any philosophical arguments. There are no intellectual, you know, empirical proofs for the existence of God here. Nothing. No, no, no philosophical discourse. No abstract discussion. All this is, is if you have any ounce of loyalty inside you, you will feel the message of this surah. That's, that's what it is. It speaks to the deeply rooted nature of the human being. Then Allah goes further. Incredible ayah. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْءِ لَشَدِيدٍ This is a very difficult ayah grammatically. It seems very simple on the tongue. Kids memorize it, right? وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْءِ لَشَدِيدٍ Very short ayah. But as far as its syntax and its depth, it's, it's profound, subhanAllah. I'll offer you a rough translation first. And how it's translated. I don't necessarily agree with this translation, but how it's commonly translated. And no doubt, he, his, his love of wealth is truly severe or intense. No doubt his love for wealth is truly intense. That's a rough translation of وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ First of all, the structure of the ayah as expected was gonna be different. And you know, Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah comments on this. He says, أَصْلُ نَظْمِ الْآيَةِ أَنْ يُقَالْ وَإِنَّهُ لَشَدِيدُ الْحُبِّ لِلْخَيْرِ إِنَّهُ لَشَدِيدُ الْحُبِّ لِلْخَيْرِ That would mean he is intense in his love for wealth. He is intense in his love for wealth. But that's not how the ayah is structured. So I have to break this down for you in English. What are the benefits of, or, or, or treasures inside this ayah? First of all, li in Arabic is used for li ajl. It's harf ajl. It's the purpose. It's, it's a word that gives purpose. If, for example, if I say I am studying for a degree. What that means is I'm studying for the purpose of a degree. So the word for implies purpose. What I'm trying to get at is the word for implies purpose. Implies purpose. Allah did not say for wealth, his love is intense. The word for is not used with wealth. The word for is used with love. Innahu li hub. Not lil khair, but li hub. Li hub khair. 
For the love of wealth, he is severe. He's intense. What does that mean? The word hub, if you look at the linguistic meaning in the Arabic language, we find as follows. The word hub means that it is defined as a perception of something desirable and one engaged in relentless pursuit of it. Hub in Arabic is defined as when you see something, you think it's very good for you. And then you do whatever you can to get it. When you're doing that, it is said you love it. Two parts. One, you think it's really good for you. It's good. And two, you do whatever you can to get it. When you have these two things together, they call it love. That's what they, how they in simplistic terms define love. Okay? So now, the word love of what? In the ayah, love of what? Hubbul khair. Khair in Arabic means good. But every mufassir says, khair in this ayah means mal. Mal, wealth. So why not say li hubbil mal? Why say what? Instead of saying the love of wealth, for the love of wealth, he becomes he's severe in his in his love of wealth and for the sake of it, for the sake of keeping that love alive, he's tough, he's he's he's, he's shadid and he's unflinching. And a shadda in Arabic is to tie a rope also. To, so he's tied up in it, he's locked in it. But here the word khayr I want to share with you an incredible comment, which we find by Ibn Zayd rahimahullah. سَمَّ اللَّهُ الْمَالِ خَيْرًا Allah named man, wealth, in this ayah as khayr, as good. وَعَسَىٰ أَنْ يَكُونَ شَرًا And it could be that it's bad. Isn't that true? Wealth could be good and wealth could also be bad. So how come? وَلَكِنَّ النَّاسِ يَجِدُونَهُ خَيْرًا فَسَمَّاهُ خَيْرًا It's because people, people always think of wealth as what? Good. So Allah called it good because Allah is basically translating the mentality of the kafir. For the kafir, there's no difference between wealth and good. Oh, you think that's good? Basically, is what we're learning here is Allah Azza wa Jalla is being sarcastic. Oh, this is what you think is good? This is what you have so much love for and it's so intense for you? For the sake of preserving that love, you are so so bent upon it and so so uh, intense? SubhanAllah. إِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِينَ This, you know, the, uh, love, the sentiment that the human being has, for what? In the previous surah, we learned something. I want to tie this together with it. This khayr, this mal, where does it come from? All of the wealth, all of the things that human beings want. They want a big house. They want nice clothes. They want a nice car. They desire, you know, the uh, uh, affections of the opposite gender. Whatever it may be, everything comes from this earth. Doesn't it? Everything comes from it and will go back into it. The question is, in the previous surah, what did Allah do with the earth? Where all your good comes from. إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَادُ مَا لَهَا SubhanAllah You're running after this wealth. You, you dig the earth to pull out its treasures. Forgetting that you will also be put into the earth. And instead of treasures only being dug out, who's gonna be dug out? You will be. You're gonna be dug out. And when you are dug out and those treasures together, you're gonna say, man, I was running after this. This was worthless. مَا أَغْنِي عَنِّي مَالِيَا my, my wealth didn't benefit me at all. هَلَكَ عَنِّي سُلْطَانِيَا My entire authority came and destroyed me. It completely dissipated from me. SubhanAllah. So this is the, the nature, the sad nature of the human being. Right now he's so intent, so bent upon the love of wealth. The word shadeed I want to comment on briefly inshaAllah ta'ala. وَهُوَ شَدِيدٌ لِهَادَ الْأَمْرُ وَقَوِيٌّ لَهُ He is very severe and tough and, and bent upon the maintenance of his love of wealth, and he's very strong about it, he's very tough about it. SubhanAllah. أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ Allah poses a question. Does he not already know? Does he then not know? إِذَا بُعْتِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُولِ When? Does he not know of the time when? Whatever is in the graves will be not just turned upside down or brought out, Ba'athara in Arabic is a compilation according to Raghib al-Asfahani of Ba'atha and A'athara. There are two words in Arabic that come together and make the, the ruba'i Ba'athara. What the verb means is, you know how you have a box full of stuff and you stick your hand in it to find something? And you're throwing everything around until you find that one thing you were looking for? To basically turn things upside down to pull something out. Allah uses that verb for what's going to happen in the graves. أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْتِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ Like a, it's gonna be, you're gonna be yanked out of your graves like junk out of a box. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Doesn't he know of the time when whatever's in the graves will be yanked out like this and pulled out from deep within? Allah didn't say إِذَا بُعْثُوا Doesn't he know the time 
when he's gonna إِذَا بُعِثَ When he will be raised, he said whatever he, whatever was in the graves will come out. Why say whatever, why not refer it to him directly? Doesn't he know when he will come out? He didn't say that. He said, well, doesn't he know when everything in the graves will come out? So why say everything? When human beings love wealth, in the beginning of the surah, what were they doing for the sake of love of wealth? You remember? What were they willing to do? They were willing to ambush and kill and pillage. When they kill, what do they do with their victims? They put them in the ground. On the day of judgment, not only will they come out of the ground, the people they put in the ground for their love of wealth, to this day, are people being killed for wealth? Are nations going to war against each other in, in pursuit of wealth? Are people being buried because of wealth? So it's not just you will come out of the ground. The people you killed, that you thought nobody cares about them because we put them in a mass grave, or we put them in hidden graves, or we buried them under the explosives. Nobody cares or knows about them, nobody knows who their name is, no, we're not gonna be asked about it. No human rights violation group came after us. There's no record left. Guess what? Ma fi al Everything in the graves is gonna come out. No evidence will remain unturned. SubhanAllah. And Allah ties the idea of loving wealth with killing in these two ayat. And this is a human tragedy. It's the case even now. Because of the level of wealth, most killing on the face of this earth is having, happening. Why? If, if nothing else but the level of wealth. People kill each other after inheritance disputes, business disputes, nations over resources like oil and you know, gas and water supplies. What is that but wealth? All of that is wealth. And people are willing to kill each other for it. Such a deep, deep reality captured in this, just two words. أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ And then he says, Subhanallah, how he completes the subject from Surah Al-Zilzal. وَحُصِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ حُصِّلَ أَوْ جُمِعَ مُحَصَّلًا فِي الصُّحُفِ أَوْ, مو أو مُيِّزًا مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ مِنْ خَيْرٍ أَوْ شَرْ The word تحصيل in Arabic, حُصِّلَ Rough translation, whatever is in the chest will be brought out. That's how it's commonly translated. But tahseen in Arabic means to peel and extract something. From like, a, like you know how banana, you peel it and you take the banana out. Now imagine like you have you know, mango or other fruits, you, take the, you peel them, you get the inside, the meat of it, the mush that you really want, and you put it together and you, come, you pile it up together. Allah uses that word for what's in the chest. Everything will be scraped out of the chest. Like the chest will be peeled off and everything on the inside will be scraped out. If you remember something about the last surah, we studied... فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ The previous surah mentioned the smallest deed, عمل. مَنْ يَعْمَلْ عمل. But actions are not in the chest. What's in the chest? This ayah is about the chest, right? The, the last ayah mentioned the smallest deed. And this ayah is going even further. Even, not even a deed, what you are hiding inside. And what are we hiding inside? The surah already mentions the human being is hiding what inside? First of all, he's hiding a testimony of his disloyalty to Allah. That's what is in the chest already now. The other thing he's hiding is the love of wealth. The love of wealth. And this will be scraped out of him. So the previous ayah mentioned amal, and this ayah mentions, this surah mentions what's in the chest, the intent, the motives, the, the testimony on the inside, subhanAllah. Completing the picture. Now when you have, you see, in other words, now Allah has the picture of what's outside and also what's? Inside. The outside was in Surah Zilzal, and this surah has what's on the inside now, right? Now you can say, Inna Rabbahum bihim yawma'idin lakhabib. There is no doubt, their master, especially in regards to them, meaning these kuffar, who think there's nobody watching them, nobody knows what's in their heart, nobody knows what they did. Especially in regards to them. Why did I say especially? Because bihim is muqaddam. We don't say, Inna Rabbahum yawma'idin lakhabirun bihim. If bihim was at the end, I wouldn't say the word especially. But this is ikhtisas, لِأَنَّهُ yuqaddam. Right? So, إِنَّ رَبَّهُمْ بِهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لَخَبِيرٌ their, their master, no doubt, especially in regards to them, on that day, on that day, now that word, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ, on that day, is a continuation of the previous threats from the previous surah. You remember, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا Right? By use of the word يَوْمَ إِذِنْ, that thread is continuing. That discourse is continuing. So now we find on that day, he will especially have khabar of them. He will be khabir of them. Fully aware. Fully knowledgeable. So now I want to compare for you two words. Alim and khabir. Alim and khabir. The word khabir rhetorically in the Arabic language is more powerful than alim. To be fully aware of the reality of something in every one of its details. Inside and out. Why is that word more appropriate in this case? 
it's more appropriate because now we've come to the point where not only does Allah know what's on the outside but also what's on the inside. And you remember last time what Allah mentioned, Allah Azza wa Jalla mentioned, He mentioned what the human being himself will see. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَاهُ He will see it. He, the human being will see it. But in this, now Allah is bringing it out for, for Himself to, to expose to Allah Azza wa Jalla. So, إِنَّ رَبَّهُمْ بِهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لَخَبِيرٌ We conclude this surah with a discourse on how the beginning of its rhetoric is tied to its end. The, the surah begins with the carefree Arab who pillages and robs and is not worried about the consequence. Who doesn't think anybody knows what's going on. Nobody knows what happened here. Nobody will keep record. But the surah ends with someone who had full news and is fully aware with every last detail on what he did on the outside and what he's keeping on the inside. In رَبَّهُمْ بِهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذِ اللَّخَبِيرِ بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي بَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ وَنَفَعْنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِالْآيَاتِ وَالذِّكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ ا